we're going to start with one of the most important, challenging issues that's before the conference, which is why it's been scheduled for a plenary session, and that is education and employment. And uh, the organizers have been very provocative in ask, ask, asking the question, is full employment possible or is it utopian? And I think the purpose of this discussion, I, I hope some of our speakers will address that issue, but I think the purpose of this discussion is really within that context of the cha employment challenge which has already been mentioned, the theme has been projected by a number of the speakers, even from our chat the night before last, I think the real question is, what is the role of education in ensuring that at least we maximize the employment, that we address the employment challenge that's related to a number of factors. The one that's been mentioned so often is the uh, fourth industrial revolution. So we'll try not to, though it's a very stimulating topic to talk about whether full employment is possible. I would myself make some comments, but I think let's our main focus is on what is the relationship between education and employment and what do we need to do to address, address the employment challenge and the gap now. So I'd like to, to start, our first speaker will be Enrique, Enrico Giovanni, who is not able to join us here now, but you, he is joining us here, as you can see, from Italy. Uh, Enrico is from the, from the Department of Economic and Economics and Finance, University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Uh, he's the director of the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, Rome. He's a fellow of the World Academy. He's a member of the board of the Executive Committee of Club of Rome. Enrico, please, you have maximum 15 minutes. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm very sorry that I couldn't join you in this important meeting, but I had some medical problems over the, the weekend I couldn't travel. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I think that the line uh, is good enough uh, to hear well what uh, I will be saying. use. Can you see them? Are you using PowerPoint? Can you see the slides? Yes, this is what I'm doing. Uh, Okay, let me see how I can manage. It should be maybe now. I hope so. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, my starting point is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that I assume everybody knows. And the reason why I start from here is because uh, uh, the 2030 Agenda provides a really an overall and integrated vision of development based on the very well-known four pillars, economy, society, environment, and institution, institutions. But what does it mean to have an integrated view? So let me share with you just uh, one chart that uh, describes uh, a closed system according to the way in which uh, ecological economists have defined it uh, since 1997. This is the way in which our Earth system works. We exchange with the rest of the universe uh, solar energy and we put waste heat in the universe. Everything else uh, is managed within uh, the our planet and what we do is to take uh, natural capital human capital social capital build capital in order to uh, produce uh, gdp through a production process part of the gdp is reinvested 
to rebuild the, the used capital or to uh, increase capital, part of it is consumed for our well-being. The way in which the production process is uh, organized and managed, for example, using slaves or engaging workers in the management of the company, uh, has an impact on people's well-being. On top, the way in which we produce and the way in which we consume creates waste. Waste in the sense of Pope Francis' encyclica Laudato Si, published in 2015, both uh, physical wastes and human wastes. Of course, both of them have an impact on uh, well-being. We don't like uh, to leave our house in the morning uh, finding a lot of uh, rubbish outside of our house, but we don't like either to have uh, homelessness who sleep out of our uh, houses. On top, the physical waste has an impact on ecological services, which has, uh, again, an impact on our well-being. And up to now, this is the scheme known uh, to ecological economy since 1997. Then I added one uh, box, which is the relationship between uh, human waste and social system services, as I call them, which uh, uh, are provided for free from by the society, including the trust, vision of future, peace. And of course, this is an important impact on well-being. Now, if we put the 17 sustainable development goals on this scheme, the SDGs uh, are not anymore just a list of targets uh, and uh, goals uh, identified through an international negotiation, but they look like a plan to change the world. And we immediately understand uh, where the different goals are in relation with the overall scheme that I mentioned to you. And so we have uh, food, uh, uh, health, and education crucial, vital to build uh, human and social capital. We have innovation that drives investments. We have uh, the uh, environmental goals that have to do with natural capital. And we have energy and work, decent work, at the core of the system, and so on and so forth. Now, the key issue here is how to change our education paradigm to uh, cope with this challenge, but also to foster the change towards sustainable development. I was part of the uh, world, uh, uh, the Global Commission of, uh, on the Future of Work uh, organized by the International Labour Office uh, over the last two years, and we published our report uh, in January. And I would suggest to look at the report, uh, which is about uh, a human-centered uh, uh, development uh, paradigm. And in that context, uh, our first recommendation is to create a new subjective right uh, in our um, legal uh, environments, the legal right uh, to work, sorry, to lot, uh, lifelong uh, uh, learning. Because the lifelong learning uh, um, is the only thing that could help us humans to cope with the incredible challenges that an unsustainable world will put before us and already is putting before us, including the, our capacity to cope with the very fast changing working environment, including automation and robotization and so on and so forth. This is just to say that instead of uh, thinking to uh, specific policies, we ha really have to change uh, the basic uh, rights for people in order to help them to uh, live in a very complex world uh, and fast-changing world. Now, uh, if this is a, a possible legal reaction 
to what I just uh, mentioned, let me say something about uh, what we are doing in Italy now uh, to uh, educate people towards sustainable development. It's a quite unique experience, I think, in Italy now, because uh, as Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, we have developed uh, some education tools, including uh, an e-learning course, which, by the way, is available also in English, if someone is interested. And now this is given to all Italian teachers of uh, elementary, intermediate, and high schools. And last year, over the last two years, almost 70,000 teachers have already taken our course. The Minister uh, of Education uh, wrote to all schools and to all universities saying sustainable development is a, a core piece of education for the future of our country. And uh, the Parliament has just passed a law about uh, the civic education in schools and the 2030 Agenda and sustainable development is part of the mandatory uh, elements of this new course. We provide uh, to teachers uh, a lot of uh, existing materials to be used uh, in their education efforts towards uh, not only environmental education but sustainable development. The point is that, uh, as the chart that I described to you clearly shows, the education to sustainable development is education to complexity to a holistic approach to the reality. And this is not what we normally teach. This is not what we normally teach in schools, but also at universities. This is why we have promoted the establishment of the Italian network of universities for sustainable development. This was uh, a declaration by the Association of Italian Rectors and uh, now this uh, network includes 70 universities out of 80. And all of them uh, in the manifesto that was signed in May during uh, the Italian Festival of Sustainable Development that we organize as ASVIS, Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, uh, all the universities committed themselves to do mainly two things. First change the way in which they manage their buildings, their activities, to move towards sustainable management, which means uh, waste management, energy management, mobility management, uh, and also the way in which uh, the cafeterias, the food is managed uh, in uh, universities. But then the second point is to change the way in which we educate to sustainable development. I'm personally chairing the subgroup uh, that deals with education for sustainable development and to sustainable development for this network of universities. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we will have a meeting uh, where we will present to uh, Italian rectors uh, the action plan that we have built over the last uh, six months. R already, a lot of universities are using uh, as a, a lesson zero, if you wish, open to all their students our e-learning course uh, on the 2030 agenda. But several courses are being established in Italian universities, both uh, in-depth courses but also horizontal courses, in order to bring uh, complexity into the uh, teaching in our Italian universities. A very important point, and I'm going towards the end, is that we don't only uh, focus, we don't have only focus on formal education, but it's very important to engage students in practical application of what they study. This is why some universities have engaged uh, uh, students in volunteering organizations, in the establishment of uh, environmental friendly environments in initiatives uh, to clean up uh, the uh, environment surrounding the university, uh, also activities 
to uh, fight against uh, disabilities and uh, inequalities within universities and so on and so forth. So together with the formal education, we need really to engage new generations in uh, changing the world. And especially after the incredible initiative by Greta Thunberg and others with the global strikes of students, we find an incredible openness in new generations to help in changing the world towards sustainable development, not only in screaming in our streets. So in conclusion, I think that education for sustainable development is the best way to help people to get an education towards a very uncertain future, a very complex future, but also to acquire the capacity of dealing with this complex world. The Italian experience with this network of universities, with this commitment by institutions to educate all citizens, especially young generations, to sustainable development and to 2030 agenda is very encouraging. Of course, a lot of things have to be set up, have a lot of resistances have to be addressed. But I think that our experience so far is quite uh, unique uh, and we are very glad to share this uh, with other countries. So if you have any interest in what uh, uh, we have been doing, you can visit uh, the English page of this, uh, our website, asbis, A-S-B-I-S dot I-T, and write to us uh, all or through the organizers of this important conference, please contact me and I will be happy to share with you our materials and activities. Thank you very much. Giovanni, thank you for your very interesting presentation. We're sorry we missed you here, uh, but uh, we certainly- I cannot hear you, sorry. Okay, why? shows it's on can you hear me now a little bit better okay well thank you very much for joining us and uh, uh, you've got us off to an excellent start on the session today thank you thank you to you okay. and excuse me again for not being with them with you okay, okay. Uh, interesting interesting themes that Giovanni raised, which I think we'll come back to during the rest of the session, uh, but he started out with something very, uh, very specific. He thinks we need to create a legal right for lifelong education. It's not going in, huh? Okay. A legal right for lifelong education. That's uh, certain something for us to discuss. Okay, then our next speaker will be Marcel Vandervoort. Marcel is professor at the Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. He's going to speak to us on closing the gap between education and future career. Marcel? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> you will not Ladies and gentlemen, you will dear friends, In the past, if you go to big companies like Philips, Shell, and many others all over Europe, you could find that people got a job there or at the end of the year, celebrated for 40 years service in the company, 50 years, 30 years. It was a time that when I was professor at various universities in Europe, that before the student finished the studies that he already got a job. Today, what is the situation in Europe, not only Europe, but in many other countries in the world, that is that a student is studied up to 25 years old, and he was then hoping after all these efforts to get a good job. Now, what is the practical situation? It becomes for these students after a PhD or an MSc, 
that they don't have difficult to find a job. Second one is uh, um, uh, they have to wait very long before they get a job, and then not a job for what they wanted or for what they have studied, with salaries which are much lower. And some of those, they got a job, and uh, 15 years later, as we know, have the cases in a number of companies, for example, a chemical company in Germany, an important one, in which I'm involved, they are 40 years old, 45, 50 years, PhDs in all kinds of topics, particularly in chemistry, and uh, yeah, they have to leave the company. It's very difficult. At 50 years, we give an early retirement. At 40 and 45, it becomes a little bit difficult. The situation where we are today, at the European Union and the European Parliament in Brussels, we are really very concerned, and also the parents, also the associations, also the community, the society, becomes very worried with this situation. And the reason is that, for the time being, their students are studying up to 25 and later up to 30 years for medical doctors, and they don't have the job or difficulties to find the job they want. On the other side, you have the industry, and the industry has many vacancies available and don't find the people. A Google in Geneva in October, they only could find 30% of the people uh, yeah, they wanted to have. Now, there is something wrong with the education, particularly at the universities, and we call it in Europe the crisis at the university. And there is a real crisis. Yesterday, I still had a talk also with the director of the university, and she also confirms the same kind of situation. So, this is a problem. Now, we have to think that in the future, we are entering the fourth industrial revolution. That means cancer will be solved, climate change will be solved, we have the car without drivers, no traffic jumps, I can go on. The fourth industrial revolution, we need a number of people. The innovations and the discoveries have to come from universities. But the university cannot, the present university cannot deliver these people. We have to change the university system. Now, what is the problem at the university? Well, the problem is there mainly that they train students for a specific job they put PhD in physics for a physics job and PhD in uh, chemistry for a chemical job. But the society is not interested in these disciplinary jobs. The society wants to have that the problems we have in the society are changed, like we could put climate change, that you finish your study, that you're ready to participate, to solve really problems which we have in the society. That means in order to do that, to solve a problem in energy, you must have the capabilities for a multidisciplinary, I call it transdisciplinary education. So over education, what we have now as the vertical education, the education between not contacts with others at the universities because there are very big walls between an institute and another. We have to find ways how to provide a multidisciplinary, a transdisciplinary education to these students so that these students can solve problems which they don't know during their study time. Problems which have to be solved that they get with a budget, in a limited budget and time, that they can solve it. And not that they are starting like 50 years ago to get the training at the company and that they can nicely integrate. They have start from the beginning. Now, in any case, in order to do that, we have to change the university. And what has to be changed is we have to get and to come to a multidisciplinary. That means that today, already in Brussels, at the European educational systems, the European rectors, we say today and advise to students, it is better to have two MSc degrees than one doctor's degree. That is already an advice which we give today. 
Now, in future, we need to have a multidisciplinary. That means the following. We cannot accept today that a medical doctor, a specialist in specific fields, is putting implants, knee, hips, and the motor, put implants, and that 25% of the implants are wrongly placed. We are now, at the European Union, established rules in such a way that we give guidelines to the hospitals in Europe, uh, to the so-called Association for Medical Doctors, to say that not every doctor or every specialist in orthopedy or in another field or cardiolog cardiology he can really do what he wants. That will be put under restrictions. It is not allowed that 25% of the treatments what you get are wrong. <laughs> and that is not only in the medical doctor, that is in many fields. So we have to give an other education to all the branches we have today. In order to do that, we have then to try to set up multi-transdisciplinary faculties at the university. I cannot go already in all these details because there is no time available. I have a report of 150 pages. I have only 12, 12 minutes in order to read all those pages. But the point is here that, for instance, a faculty in medicine will be transformed in a, medical, in, in, in a faculty of medicine, engineering together, together with uh, other faculties without uh, neglecting the topics of ethics, without uh, uh, forgetting the topics which are related uh, to human relations, to philosophy, uh, uh, etc. But uh, education, which is in any case very broad and very specialized at the same time, to be a specialist in physics, chemistry, ex at the same time. And the point is here that yesterday the rector said, in its speech, if you do that in multidisciplinarity, then you cannot give the education what is needed. It is not going into depth. I disagree completely. We will give in future an excellent education in various disciplines and at the same time to be very qualified. It is not for everybody who will be able to study each of those. Uh, you have a number of these problems. Now, we have set up in Europe an, uh, a group of experts within the framework of European Union, the same as with the Americans, the same as Japan and China. With those four, we have the academies, we have the European Rectors meeting, we have a number of bodies, and uh, we are now setting up these new structures for the university. Like I said, it is for the time being still difficult to say. Our main problems are the professors, they are absolutely incapable to teach the multidisciplinary topics. There are still many professors in Europe who only teach the same course for 30 years. The problem is also here about the so-called, we have to be worldwide. Therefore, that is all the worldwide nations are already taking part, more or less for advanced nations and the best universities. The problem is that they, um, at some universities who are excellent in Europe and are on the best ranking, like Caltech in the United States, MIT in the United States, if you look about Tokyo University, if you look about the best schools, they already have done it and doing it. If you look about MIT, the medical and engineering are already close together. In many universities we don't have. Now the point is that we train a student not only for a region, like we do it now, like here in Serbia, there is money for the universities coming from Serbian government, and all in all places, it is very local. We have to get worldwide. The people should be trained, multidisciplinary, and at the same time for worldwide jobs. I think I don't have much more time to... Um, Gary told me already, stop, so I will stop here. But that is the way to go. And we have problems, number one, with the universities. We are much too bureaucratic. And we have second point, the problem is we don't have the right professors. And what do we have to do? We are now in a, in a number of universities in Europe. We try to get out of the professors at 
55 years old, and what are we doing with those who are 40 and 45, and they are not capable for the job. Thank you for your Thank attention you. and a few words. We do have two or three minutes for questions to Marcel. Yes, Dragon. Yes. Before you respond, because we've got a lot of hands and very little time, let's hear the questions and then we'll see how we address them. Yes. Thank you very much. Briefly, sorry, just because of the time. So. Just to say that if we uh, put together, amplified in a dilemma that uh, Hans raised in his conference, and that is good modern university may have curricula. Olivia? Momir. Yeah. Uh, around, in my knowledge, more than 1,500 universities around the world. And there is a huge variety of what's university. <laughs> no one knows what's university. University in states are of one size. In Europe, on another size. I took delegation of uh, president of national assembly of Israel to Doris Pack. We're not going to answer now. Briefly, please. Universities can become a business issue. Harvard or top 20 universities are business issue. And another, from my experience, I got many diplomas from us in the top university, which is among 20 in the world. They become the clubs. I have a club in the world. Thank you, Mim. Thank you, Mamir. Very important. I'm sorry, I'm going to frustrate the audience, including myself, by saying that we don't have time to hear further from uh, Marcel. He's raised such provocative issues, there's no way we can, we're already running ahead, uh, or over, rather. Uh, so I think this is something I hope we can address in the subsequent sessions and at the breaks, because he has succeeded in his mission of provoking our thinking on an important issue. Thank you again. And now our next speaker is Eric Hoydel, who's a member of the Board of Trustees of the, uh, of the World Academy and also a longtime educator uh, in Europe. Eric, I take over wherever this, yeah. you wish. Yes. That was excellent. Thank you. That was excellent. I will speak about uh, sustainable uh, entrepreneurship, which is, uh, I think, a compliment which has been raised uh, now. And I, I, I take uh, four points. The first one is the relation of sustainable entrepreneurship and democracy. The second is I will refer to some aspects of the SDGs, and then I go in some detail, but not very far, 
what sustainable entrepreneurship has to be in the, the context of human capital, productive capital and financial capital. And finally, I will refer again to democracy because I think what democracy uh, connects with all activities in the society is that people have to be active, active based on their values they have. So to the first point, traditional entrepreneurship concentrates on the quantitative combination of financial, productive and human capital and optimize the return on capital and uh, human capital and its remuneration is just a residuum. This is the rest. In contrast, sustainable, and, uh, sustainable entrepreneurship has to include the societal dimensions of capital inputs, refer to the limits all over the world and also locally, and activate the human potentials to increase uh, and uh, uh, distribute more equal the societal wealth. So such a turn from capital-centered to human-centered entrepreneurship uh, needs a activation of the whole population. So what is needed is an entrepreneurship of the large population and everybody has to be included because everybody is active in some sense according to its, uh, its uh, surrounding and uh, through the interconnectivity of each person to the society it contributes to, so to societal wealth. Uh, and uh, on the institutional level, we can distinguish between private households, uh, private firms, and uh, public governance as the main potential actors for sustainable development. Sustainable consumption, wealth creation by firms, and uh, public policy depends on a multi uh, dimensional entrepreneurial behavior which combines, and this is more or less the definition of entrepreneurship, it combines creative thoughts and leadership in action to enlarge the role of the individual freedom. So entrepreneurship is intimately connected to the main target of uh, what the World Academy has adopted uh, in Cadmus Journal and many other uh, pu publications. So this role of an active society uh, has to be seen in the uh, context of uh, the development of the global whole through the interconnectivities, uh, which is more than the sum of individual activities and also more than the sum of the three main actors, uh, private households, private firms and uh, public policy. Therefore, because it's more than the sum of the individual output, the total wealth of the society belongs to the society and not for an individual institution or an individual person. Uh, this implies a responsibility of all those who use wealth for acting in the society and creating further wealth. Uh, therefore, the society delivers capital to private firms We are just trusted trustees of societal wealth. They are not owner. The owner is the society of societal wealth. And uh, firms are just trustees to manage it and they have a vicarian role for the social demands. 
It is uh, an inversion of the traditional perspective of entrepreneurship. And uh, during a tra the transition, wealth creation may deviate from the preferences of the consumers or distort public policy, and an active, sustainable entrepreneurial behavior of private firms as well as public policy and each individual has to uh, correct these deviations from uh, uh, currently dominant activities and distortions of uh, the societal wealth. So this needs a cooperative behavior in contrast to the actual competition of uh, uh, the societal networks of uh, human capital, financial capital, and productive capitals, which are not uh, a quantity, but they are networks, interrelated networks, and especially uh, financial capital can enlarge the uh, total uh, wealth of society, but it can be also through substitution of natural capital by man-made capital, so we can enlarge the possibilities uh, of wealth creation at, uh, as a whole. Traditionally, uh, we think that uh, uh, entrepreneurship contributes to economic growth, and uh, economic growth is uh, sometimes considered, still considered as an augmentation of the societal wealth. In contrast, sustainable entrepreneurship of all involved people uh, has to change this interrelation of the uh, capital networks and all this needs more human capital. So, turning from traditional entrepreneurship to sustainable entrepreneurship creates employment. Uh, more employment at, at every level because each decision is uh, only possible to an input, an additional input of a human capital. And uh, this is directly linked to the democracy. Everybody who uh, turns from prevailing economic growth to sustainable development uh, increases more human capital, and at the same time, it's contribu it contributes also to the democracy. Because in every institution and in every coin of the society, uh, the humans are active, employment increases, and this is nothing else but that what we say, uh, the Anthropocene is... Uh, 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 producing uh, the society and the, its development. So, uh, democracy uh, is uh, a precondition and also a result of uh, all uh, sustainable entrepreneurship. So, I will shortly uh, refer to SDGs because we know SDGs in the first presentation it was uh, 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 elucidated uh, changes the whole structure of uh, wealth creation in the society globally and locally. And uh, this uh, implies that it, it uh, is needed a very important transfer of capital to every uh, area uh, in, the, in the world. And uh, if we want to give uh, money for this, this should be combined with entrepreneurial behavior of those who receive the money. Bringing water to a thirsty horse has no effect. It has to drink it for uh, winning the race. So sustainable uh, development is bound to an entrepreneurship 
in those receiving additional money coming out from uh, new currencies or uh, taxation of, uh, of um, financial capital and so on. So this might be a result that the return on capital is not anymore the target and uh, in producing money to, for example, developing country is bound to the well-being of them and well-being has, has to guide the allocation of all financial means which are collected in, mainly in the, in the industrial countries. So uh, this means we have to face that uh, two, two. we have to face that the return on capital which we transfer to underdeveloped areas has to be, the, the, has to be decoupled from the return on capital. Social capital has priority over financial capital, productive capital, and so on. So, uh, one example is the Marshall Plan. Uh, you know, after the Second World War, the Marshall Plan was very successful in both countries, uh, American and European countries, and it was derived from the interaction of democratic societies and a large amount of human capital. So to transfer uh, in the global Marshall Plan financial means to the, the underdeveloped countries or less developed countries needs an uh, uh, augmentation of human capital, which means in this case primarily human capital oriented towards sustainable entrepreneurship. It is not enough to educate people in the less developed countries. They have to have the uh, capacity to implement sustainable entrepreneurship and uh, uh, firms which create uh, well-being in those countries. So in all Education for entrepreneurship is a very important part within all over, uh, uh, overall education. Education is very important in all areas, but the dimension of entrepreneurship is crucial for the sustainable, uh, for the SDG implementation. So I cannot refer uh, to more detailed questions uh, in any case, we have to uh, recognize that many transfers to the developing countries, they are uh, channeled uh, in corruptive uh, uh, areas and uh, not for product productive use. It is only sustainable entrepreneurship in the sense that they are just trustees. Uh, which can be, uh, which can bring a global, more equal societal development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're running quite far behind, but one or two questions, which we won't answer. Questions, again. please. Anyone? Yes, I know, but we just don't. The very idea of this session is provocative in itself, and the idea of addressing such an important question in one hour with four speakers without time for discussion is uh, teasing the issue. Uh, and with just 15 minutes left, I'd like to try to put the whole thing in a a little perspective. We've touched on very important issues. All the three speakers have touched on very important issues. But I'd like to go back to the 
the full topic, not to answer it, but to put it in a perspective. Is full employment possible? That's easy, solves, saves, saves a lot of time. The idea that, uh, that full employment is not possible goes back more than 100 years to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, or especially when it had big impact on agriculture. And it gained great momentum with the population explosion after the 1950s when uh, medical technology dramatically reduced infant mortality and we saw this big boost in population which began to reach working age in the 70s and 80s particularly and by the 90s was quite daunting. At that time we did a study in India where seven million youth were entering the workforce every year seven million, and we asked whether full employment was possible in India. Nobody had ever asked the question because the answer was so obvious. No, it's not possible. And we worked on a strategy and showed that we could create 100 million jobs within 10 years. And we didn't expect anybody to take us seriously, but from the prime minister down, the government took it very seriously and implemented a strategy uh, in the early 90s to address it when, when new entrance was 7 million a year. Now put it in perspective, creating 100 million jobs in 10 years is equivalent to how many jobs the U.S. created in the 20th century. 100 million jobs. We wanted to do it in 10 years. Now the situation in India is that there are 12 million youth entering the workforce. Not 7 million, 12 million a year. And yet Wages continue to rise, salaries continue to rise. Uh, the, it's difficult to find labor, even unskilled labor, let alone skilled labor of different sorts, uh, because the society is expanding. So I think the issue no longer is whether or not we can absorb the population. We have absorbed the population, and if you look at the data, I'm, I don't have time to present it, but over the last, since 1950, job growth has been faster than working age population growth in the, world, in the world as a whole. It doesn't mean we haven't had ups and downs as we had in Europe after the end of the Cold War with the dislocations, with reunification of Germany and everything. Population is not the problem. Now we have a problem up until after 2008 we do have a problem of rising unemployment in, in, in Europe and elsewhere, and I would say neoliberalism has been the problem. The policies have been the problem, not the inherent incapacity of global society to find meaningful ways for each human being to employ their activities for productive purposes. And uh, uh, Eric has touched on some of those issues, and we'd, we've had days and days of conferencing on what is fundamentally wrong with our economic policies, our economic institutions, and our economic theory. We are still incentivizing capital investments, energy-intensive investments. We're shift, we've putting all our money into fossil fuels which are, uh, which are threatening the planet instead of the kind of shift uh, that's necessary to make livelihoods for everybody and sustainable development for everybody possible. Now we've come here not talking about population, not talking about neoliberalism, we're talking about technology and the fourth industrial revolution. Is it a threat? Is it going to wipe out all jobs? If we continue the way we are, it can do it, just like uh, uh, neoliberalism has done it or uh, anything else has done it. It can do it unless we recognize that the results of technology depend on our policies. We have incentivizing capital investments in energy-intensive, capital-intensive in ways to remove and make people not only dispensable but an irrelevant productive resource. We have widening inequality. We have lower and lower amounts of the uh, income generated by business going to labor, uh, more and more going to shareholders, used to buy back shares and everything, uh, and in many other ways that we don't have time to discuss. What 
the result of technology is going to depend on the policy framework within which we're implementing these new technologies. If we're going to leave them unregulated the, la the way we've left global financial systems, markets unregulated for the last 30 years, it will be a real challenge. It doesn't mean that it's inevitable. And the, the theme that's come out here very well with our existing speakers and in earlier sessions is that there is a growing mismatch between the, the education we're giving and the, the needs of the workplace today and the evolving needs of technology. It doesn't mean these are really valid issues, but it's all in a wider context. And if that wasn't enough, we've got another issue now breathing down our throats. Giovanni politely uh, referred to it, but he could have put with fire and brimstone instead of that. Regardless, the real tech threat is not technology. The real threat is the environment. The real threat is we cannot continue to try to raise the well-being of humanity simply by multiplying economic growth perpetually in the same old dead model that's destroying the planet. So the challenges are really real. My only reason for putting this in a framework is, edu can education solve the employment problem by itself? I think absolutely not. Can we continue with the education we have and expect to solve the employment problem? Absolutely not. We've got a crisis here, or you can call it an opportunity, I'm an optimist, but we need a radical change in the educational institutions as we need in our economic institutions, our economic policy, our business framework, and in every part of the society. And that's why the World Academy is not specializing in employment or economics, though we have programs on all of them, unless we look at the whole picture. We are in a complex, interconnected world. Unless we look at the linkage between our education and our economics and our monetary theory and our social and our democracy, our economic policies now are undermining, I referred to it on the opening morning, they're undermining the stability of democratic institutions in the world, creating new polarizations, uh, spurring popularization, uh, and all right-wing e extremism. We have to look at this as a whole, and that's why uh, a number of our speakers have emphasized that we can't use this fragmented analytic thinking that looks at one problem or one aspect at a time. We've got to look at the, we've got to learn, our education has to change at a fundamental level of the way we view reality. We've got not only to know that there are lots of pieces to the puzzle, but we have to keep in mind what's the whole purpose of this. What is the whole purpose of the society we've created? Our education is not just for jobs. Our econ economy is not just for GDP. It's for the well-being of everybody on the planet. And that means it's not enough we change our institutions. We have to change at the level of theory. In the academy, we have an international working group on economic theory. Half of the members are not even economists because we have to look at it in its entirety as a social phenomenon. We need a reframing, not just of the way we teach. We need a reframing of the research and the thinking that's done in society. We can't afford to divide the disciplines, not just because students need different skills, but because our thinking is no longer valid in a society, if it was ever fully valid, in a society which is so complex. So the, the, the lessons and messages go very deep. Institutional change is not enough. Policy change is not enough. Change in our theory is not enough. Change in our pedagogy is not enough by itself. Change in our fundamental thinking. So I'm not saying this in any way in, as in a, in, with pessimism. I'm just trying to chart out, I think, the way we have to, the way I think we should be looking at the problem is a global problem, is an integrated problem, and there are solutions. We know the solutions. We know the solutions to stimulate employment. We know solutions for improving education. We're highlighting a number of them here. We know we need a shift from this passive transfer of information to developing thinking 
uh, uh, and uh, in the individuals, but most of the education in the world is still just transfusion of information. Uh, and uh, and I, I work in countries where I see it all the time. We know that the development of the person and the capacity of the person to adapt the personality of the person is absolutely essential to live in this complex world. And what they learn academically may be less important than the development of their values, the development of their social skills, their capacity to work and collaborate with each other. Uh, business tells us very clearly, you spend so many years training students to compete with each other, work alone and compete with each other. Once they come into our company, they never do anything alone. And the one thing we look for is collaboration and cooperation. And very few of them are really qualified for that. So I think the message I'd like to bring from, take away from this session is education is absolutely important and radical change is necessary. It's not sufficient by itself, and we have to integrate that education, but education is not just about teaching. Education are, is, is, has the presiding, ruling ideas that are governing society today. So it's not just what we teach in the classroom, it's what we think in our disciplines. And if multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary thinking is necessary in the classroom, it's even more necessary at the theoretical level because it's those policies, political, economic, social policies, cultural policies, that are the, th the thinking on which they're based, the fundamental thinking on which they're based that is determining, we see it as a result in the society. Thank you. I think we're already uh, over time. Uh, comments, but no, no answers, that's all. Momir, briefly, that please. We don't. Agreed. Exactly. We do not. Students we educate now. I mentioned yesterday, sixty-five percent of the jobs today do not exist today in this country. Right. So that's a problem in education. Definitely. And as I mentioned yesterday. Okay, let's take Momir. Anyone else would like to raise a question or comment? So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Robert and then Olivia. We have a mic here. Uh, thank you. Uh, one quick point, I guess. Uh, we talk about sustainable development as an end point. Uh, we talk about the SDGs uh, uh, as uh, aspirational goals. What we have failed to do, I think, is to identify pathways that are coherent with the finite planet on which we live uh, uh, that would lead us uh, uh, to the attainment of the system change that's, co that's consistent with our uh, aspirational goals. Absolutely. Thank you, absolutely. Olivia, you had something?
Thank you. You've summarized what I wanted to say much obviously more clearly than I did. It's, in, it's part of a wider issue, and we have to look at the totality. Thank you.